Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. This week we have an exciting announcement. We have a new sponsor, Kia UK. Kia have been embedded in the world of cricket for almost 15 years. They've actively supported the rise in women's cricket since 2014 and have been proud sponsors of Surrey County Cricket Club for the last decade. Kia are in fact our very own neighbours here at the Kia Oval. During each episode of the podcast, Kia will provide you with an opportunity to get closer to the action through their Kia's movement that inspires moment. These include tickets and experiences to key cricket competitions across the summer. Listen out each week to hear how you could get involved and win the opportunity of a lifetime. The test summer is nearly upon us. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today, one day out from the start of the England-Ireland test at Lords, is Phil Walker and Ben Gardner, who's back from his travels in Ireland. Um, that test is the first of eight tests across the next two months. Billy asks, how excited are you for this test summer? Personally, I'm just buzzing and think it has the potential to be on a par with some of the best ever. And I just can't wait for it to start. Phil, how excited are you? What about the whole thing? About the whole thing. Uh, sincerely, I think it's the most anticipated series. Did I literally say this last week? I probably did. I think it's the most anticipated series that I can remember, certainly since 05. Hmm. Um, because the stakes are high. The uh, two teams are bewitchingly hard to define. Um, it could go one way, it could go t'other. other. Um, the, the Women's Ashes runs concurrently, given the platform it deserves. Um, just this week as well, you know, we have a, an, an interesting game that's going to play out at, at Lords. By the way, Ben, did they... Was it the talk of the town when you're when you're in Ireland? <laughs> no, so I was seeing a lot of a lot of relatives. I've got quite a lot of Irish family, and uh, the questions were always do, like, do they know what's they, happening? No, they, they'd ask, "What do you do?" And I'd say, "Cricket journalist." They'd say, "Oh, okay," and then they'd ask, "Are Ireland good at cricket?" And I'd say, "Yeah, they're about twelfth in the world. They're actually playing against England next week." And they'd be like, "Oh, that, 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 that's nice, basically." Lovely. So yeah, I wouldn't say it's it's quite got the cut through, which I guess we'll come to a bit more later, I suppose. Mm. Um, ben, you weren't on last week's show. How excited are you for the summer? Oh uh, yeah, I'm really excited. I mean. I, like obviously we we bemoan the schedule a lot but there are some ways where it works really nicely right when you have like a whole period of t20 cricket or you know of, and then you get back to a test match like oh, this is great and you can really kind of sink your teeth into that you can think about and sort of let ruminate over over several days and then you'll have a stretch of those and you'll be like actually quite fancy a bit of a bit of hundred now kind of thing um so yeah i'm i'm, I'm really really looking forward to it and this will be a nice way to ease in i think while also having uh lots of interesting subplots of its own i think mm. um they're, they're both very likable cricket teams as well if you're talking about the, the the men's ashes sides they're both very uh attractive teams on and off the pitch uh jeff lemon um the brilliant australian writer has written a superb piece for the upcoming magazine um about the the current identity of the australian team and how that fits in with the the history of the baggy green and if you like the fetishization of the baggy green um and how there is a there is a a confrontation with um the sort of the the ugliness of the day okay regarding social media regarding the distortions that are a part of everyday discourse and an australian side that is um deliberately and consciously humane and progressive and uh, politically engaged and it, through Cummins or through Kawaja you have people who now actively look to use their voice whether it's Cummins on the climate crisis or it's Kawaja on interracial relationships uh, within within Australian culture um, this is a this is a side that if you like has reshaped what it is to represent and symbolize Australian culture and some people don't like it, uh, but I do, and Jeff Lemon does, and uh, those who are on that side of the fight, uh, there's a lot to get your teeth into with this Australian side. As Mel Farrell was saying very well last week on the show, that there's that that kind of old cliche is redundant with this team that they're a gnarly bunch of bastards who just want to crush you and destroy you and still you know, some they, of them left and then drink you under the table <laughs> there's, there's maybe like a whiff of it sure there's a whiff of it but it seems like they stand for something else now and as we know the england cricket side are standing for you know they're 
self-proclaimed saviors of, of 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 everything we hold dear. So it's 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 got this sort of interesting a sub element to it over and beyond runs wickets catches uh, balls ups bad run outs fluffed run outs and all the rest of it but in terms of runs wickets catches etc oh yeah that's th- stuff yeah. Th- this is that's still good. it's good stuff as well th- this is this is kind of legacy defining stuff for this australia team because when you go through the team you think that's a great cricket team right you've got david warner great at the game Marlis Labuschain will be a great at the game. Steve Smith, all-time great. Yeah. That bowling attack, all greats at the game. Pat Cummins, probably be an all-time great. And yet, I don't think you can call them a great cricket team because they haven't really won anything of note in Test cricket, especially. Well, firstly, that you're right. I don't disagree with that. Secondly, they might win next week, so well, they that's, might be that's crowned. The thing. So they might go into that first Test as World Test champions. But if 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 they come out of this summer having won the World Test Championship and having won the Ashes, then fine, that's a great Australia team. If they don't, then you look at it and you look at all that talent mm. and you look at this being kind of close to sort of like a, a last hurrah for that group of players all together and you think, actually, what did that amount to? You know, they've won one series away from home in the last seven years, I think. They've been beaten quite a few times at home in that time as well. Mm. Um, but this, this is the thing that will decide, is this a, a great Australia team or is this a team that actually was quite a lot less than some of its parts? Yeah, and that will be a... a like an anxiety in the back of the minds, I think. Uh, they haven't yet had a defining series really in tricky conditions. You know, they always beat the English at home. That goes without saying. And they beat the middling teams. They steamroll all the middling teams. But Cummins, with the exception of that, that easy run against England two and a half years ago or a year and a half ago, he doesn't yet have a sort of statement win under his own captaincy. Pax on away was decent, but actually, I guess yeah, in, that's fair. But also, fair. England actually blew that out of the water with how dominant they were in a similar series later that year. Um, back to the Lords Test that, that starts tomorrow. The big news for England is Josh Chung will make his England debut at Lords. Ben, I reckon the majority of our listeners have either never heard of Josh Tung or know very, very little about him other than Joe Harmon picking him out <laughs> as one to watch at the start of the season and pick and, and tipping him for a potential he's England pretty, debut. He's pretty pleased with himself. He's, he's been very pleased with that. not a day goes by when he doesn't <laughs> mention this. He came into the office and said, make sure you mention that on today's show, <laughs> yeah, didn't he? So. Yeah, he did. Um, ben, tell us a little bit about Josh Tung and why England might have picked him. Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing when you look at his record, it, it's a it's a big surprise because... In the last two summers, he's taken 16 wickets at an average above 40. You know, you could find like like 60 bowlers probably who've taken, who've got a better record than that in that time. Um, but he's also someone they've rated for a really long period of time. Uh, I think for Worcestershire, I think it was in 2017, he spearheaded a, a promotion push, took about or just under 50 wickets at an average of, of 25 when uh, when wickets weren't easy to come by. And, and that was, as a, I think, as a teenager. And that really, really impressed people. That caught the eye and... From that point, and I think bef- maybe he was then on a young uh, England 19 tour. He did uh, England Lions even at that stage. He was in the England Lions squad for the 2017-18 Ashes. So they've long liked him. Uh, he's he's tall. He's quick enough. Uh, he gets good bounce. Um, he's also just had loads and loads of injuries, sort of multiple stress fractures. And that he is- was close to jacking it all in. Yeah. Is that right? Last year. Last, Last year. year. And it was, um, was what he had a there was one appointment with a shoulder specialist, I think, that before that he was sort of like, if this doesn't go well, that might be it. And then mm. that goes well and a year later he's in a he's in a test squad. And I think what they'll have taken more into account than his work in the county championship, he was on a Lions tour earlier this year, which again shows how much they rate him considering how Liddy played last summer. And that was in an attack with Sam Cook and Matt Fisher, who would be, you know, two others who would have been contenders for this squad. And he out bowled those two in Sri Lanka, took a five from the first innings and three weeks in the second. And that was, you know, on uh, wickets that wouldn't have been conducive. That would have really, really made them, uh, really made them take notice. And I think Rob Key was in attendance for that game as well. Um, I, I think I really, yeah, I just wanted to highlight. You're pleased about this, aren't you? Um, that he's been called in. I, I like the thinking behind it that they've identified someone a few years ago as potentially being really good. So he, he basically took 100 first class wickets at like 22, 23. By the age of 20, he'd already been on a couple of Lions tours. Um, he's not taken more than 20 wickets in a first class season since that season in 2018 when he was 20 years old. That's how serious his injury troubles have been. But he's barely played in the last two years and they still wanted him 
as soon as he was fit again to go to a Lions tour. So he's obviously seen something. And I think you can understand what they're trying to do. They're not saying this guy is going to lead England to Ashes victory, but with no Archer, no Stone, even no Jamie Overton and no Bryden Cast, they are short on point of difference bowlers other than Wood. And I don't think this is them actually saying that Tongue is definitely that, mm. but they're saying he might be. And this test match is a bit of a free hit to see if he makes that step up. Apparently, he's been bowling really well in the nets. And that does that does mean something. And I'm kind of glad that means something. Mm. Um, Ollie Robson was with the England squad for a year and a half without getting a go when everyone was saying he's bowling well in the nets. So I like the thinking, if it doesn't work, kind of so what? Chris Wokes is the guy who's not playing this test match, but you know exactly what Chris Wokes is going to give you in home test matches. And I don't think you lose anything from Wokes not playing this game. Do you, think, do you think they've not played Wokes as well because they're unsure about the fitness of Robinson and Anderson for... That That was exactly yeah. what I read it. The big one the week after. That they might need to go to Wokes for that. And that was also, we had a question about why is Mark Wood not playing this game? And I think it's similar with that. If you think you can get Mark Wood for three tests this summer, why would you have one of them be this one when mm. it can be... Three Ashes tests. I, I wish I hadn't said it before the show because th- there's no <laughs> there's no surprise uh, now. But Jason Gillespie, it is for the listeners. Jason yeah. <laughs> Gillespie is is who Josh Tongue reminds yeah. me of. It's a fun game, isn't it? When you have a player come through and you you try and see who they remind you of, and there's a sort of snap in the action and an elasticity in the body. There's a there's a sort of pronounced jump in the delivery stride. He's quite limmy. Uh, and yeah, that's who he reminds me of. Not quite as quick, but has a same, the same kind of zip as, mm. as Gillespie, who was in his pomp an absolutely stunning bowler. Mm. And I think that um, bowlers do just kind of come out of nowhere. And I don't think it's that dissimilar to someone like Sakeem Mahmood playing uh, last year in, against West Indies. Mahmood, be- similar age, had barely played that much first class cricket through injury. But the difference being that Mahmood had played more white ball cricket but England had identified something at a really young age. They liked Mahmood and they backed him that when he's fit, he's going to be in and around the setup. And also another part of this is how many bowlers have been injured or are currently injured. They're not saying that Tongue is the fifth best seamer in England. This is effectively 11th, 12th choice mm-hmm. as it was with Mahmood when he got picked last year. Yeah, and Mahmood was the one I initially thought is like, how come he's not in the squad? But actually, when you look at it, he's back fit, but he hasn't yet put up that performance that is like, I'm back bowling at my best. And I think we will just want to see that a bit like they wanted to with Ollie Robinson last summer. They want to bring him in when he's fit and firing rather than sort of getting him just when he's sort of on his on his way back, I think. Mm. So that's fair enough. Um, another England story from the pre-test build-up that's worth touching on. Um, McCullum wasn't hugely confident about the prospect of Stokes bowling soon. He said, I think he'll bowl at some stage throughout the summer. Yeah, no doubt. He's a world-class all-rounder. And if he's able to bowl, fantastic. If not, we'll find a way. Um, mm. Ben, if, if if Stokes doesn't bowl, do you think England will back the four specialist bowlers plan that they've had so far? Um, in the pre-Stokes captaincy era, England often had either a Wokes, Moeen or Curran at seven when Stokes wasn't around. They basically changed the balance of the side to accommodate an additional bowler. Yeah, and they also often went with uh, without a spinner, didn't they, when they uh, when they needed to, to rejig in that case. And Jack Leach obviously didn't play a home test for ages. Um, I think they would stick to it, I think, because they're, they're kind of brash like that now. They don't tend to think about worst case scenarios. What if a team are, you know, 400 for five and we need to go to a fifth bowler? I think they'll think, let's back these four guys to bowl a team out and then let's back uh, um, let's back the batter score runs. And they've also, they've kind of deliberately tested themselves this, haven't they? There was one of the tests last summer when Stokes was like, I'm just not going to bowl. And then um, that allowed the others sort of prove that they could be a four-man attack. So I, th- I think they're in a they're in a decent position for it, but obviously you do worry that if it's you know Broad Anderson and Wood, and you don't want any of those guys bowling loads of overs, then what does the attack look like if uh, if Labuschagne and Smith put a bit of a stand together? Um, but I, I think they would back. I don't think they would rejig the side, but equally, you know, they do have some attractive rounders who could sit at number seven. But then if you if you pick someone at number seven, who do you then leave out from that top six? That's that's an even harder decision than the than the folks one really isn't it so yeah. um I, I can see by the end of the summer that sam curran's played some part in the ashes um, and i know that the point you make is obviously rock solid how the hell do you get him in without weakening one side or the other but if england are down after two or three test matches you will see some uh some funkiness 
suddenly become very much normalized mm-hmm. right and if it does mean that you drop an opener or if it means that you shake shake it around and you move best so up to five and someone else up to open blah 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 if it doesn't quite work for either of, of Crawley or Duckett then being the most obviously vulnerable figures currently in the top six um I, I can see that playing out if England are down for sure but also we, we are assuming and the McCullum lines on Stokes they were jarring for sure and we're assuming that it's going to be a problem for him. But we don't know. And there's not much value either. And I'm not saying that they play silly buggers because it's not really their style and kidology is not really a part of part of the whole philosophy. But there's not much value in saying, oh, yeah, Stokesy will be bowling, definitely, if they're not sure. And so it's possible still that in a, in a few weeks' time... He's fine. He, he will be fine. Yeah. He, and he will be able to do that wrecking ball thing that he does from time to time where he doesn't bowl for two days. And then he, he'll give you 12 overs off the reel on a Saturday afternoon. And then he won't bowl again for another week mm. as adrenaline, cortisone, and all the rest of it flows through his veins. Mm. Um, just on Stokes, I wanted to draw people's attention to two pieces written in the last week about Stokes. Uh, one from Vatushan Hantharaja at ESPN Quick Info, looking back at Stokes' first, first month as skipper. Um, lots of very interesting little details about decisions that he made, conversa- conversations he made sure he had with players before they met up for the first time as a squad. Um, I just think it's quite interesting in, in how it shows how deeply he thought about lots of aspects um, of the job from day one and how it's obviously so much more than vibes. And then, Phil, then a piece that you shared on on your Twitter account, Donald McRae's interview with Mike yeah. Greeley about Stokes. Yeah, I thought it was superb. Firstly, Donald, Donald McRae is probably the most complete um, sports interviewer out there, I think, uh, and Brearley, who has a new book out, um, is as sharp as ever uh, and as astute as ever. And there's just so many good lines in it about his impressions of Stokes, his impressions of Stokes and McCullum, and the way that they're both they're simultaneously extrovert and introvert, which which becomes a very powerful combination when you're trying to penetrate the psyches of your your team. Um, there's loads of good lines in it, but one that jumped out Brearley says. Um, I'm interested in this question. Can the two selves help each other? Maybe what's going on internally and between them means they can move between these two positions. And he uses the example of Stokes at Headingley in, 20, in 2019 when he made, you know, two and 70 odd balls and then, and then 180 odd balls. And he says he changed gears dramatically and that coordination between different parts of the self is like standing back and reflecting and then being passionate and spontaneous. Stokes and McCullum are very like-minded and have real presence. They've got that extrovert capacity, but McCullum is sober, quiet, and reserved at matches. They also have an infectious enthusiasm for, enthusiasm for their ideas. Uh, and Stokes' empathy and introspection, which came through in the Sam Mendes documentary, which really references, is absolutely a key part of, of his makeup, I think. And... People who know him have been aware of that from quite an early age. It was always a very sort of simplistic and lazy and inaccurate characterization of him as being a sort of, you know, ballsy, chest out, alpha dog type character. There was always a lot more going on with Ben Stokes uh, than people saw initially, I think. And now you're seeing it in the way that he he, he leads his team and reshapes the nature of the job in so many ways. And so it's interesting to hear Brilly, who's 80, 81 now, I think something like that, uh, observing it with as much uh, enthusiasm and excitement as, as ever. I thought it was really interesting how he pointed to both in Stokes and McCullum, how they've both overcome depressive periods. Um, he pinpoints one moment in McCullum's captaincy where I think they bowled out for 45 and he basically strips everything back as like, why do we play this game? And talk about how liberating that can, can be. And I know that's quite speculative, but Brearley is potentially the most qualified man in the world <laughs> to talk about this stuff. It's also um, not that speculative because McCullum totally acknowledged it himself. Um, if, you know, one day we might do something in the magazine where you, the 20 sort of moments that shaped this current story of English men's cricket that would be one of them 45 all out when you've been Dale stained and embarrassed and humiliated they consciously stripped everything back did that New Zealand side at the time there were 
there were rivets and problems in the dressing room because the captaincy had been ch- changed hands. And McCullum used that as a sort of ground zero, clean slate starting point, and and built something very powerful on the back of that. Uh, I think the consequences of that revelation for McCullum are now being felt in the England side. Mm. I think, sorry, just the other moment on McCullum that I think was also pivotal was actually the, the death of Philip Hughes. So that came uh, half or, well, after one day, I think, of a, a test match against Pakistan in, in 2014. Um, and Pakistan had made 350, or at least they might have been uh, way ahead of the game. I think maybe 280 for three at, uh, at Stumps on day one. And I think it's overnight that Hughes gets struck on the head. Um, and the day, the test actually pauses for a day at that point. And McCullum and Hughes were, were really close and they might have played grade cricket together. Uh, the next day, McCullum comes out and hits 202 of 188 balls. Barely celebrates any of his milestones. New Zealand don't really celebrate any of their wickets the whole game. They rack up 700 win by an innings. And I think that was a game that also, obviously it was a terribly sad moment. I think there was an amount of perspective that was taken from that about, you know, what is cricket? What's it supposed to mean? What What is this sport to us? How do we want to play it? And that also, I think, helped mm-hmm. reshape his leadership and how they went forward as a team, I think. Uh, the reason why I wanted to pick out those two pieces on the Stokes is that, I get a sense that from some quarters, the build-up to the Ashes um, and the chat around Stokes and McCollum, it's almost being seen that the Ashes is is like a referendum on is what they're doing the right way to do things. I think that completely misses the point. Australia might just be a much better cricket side. And I think both pieces illustrate really, really well how whatever happens this summer, what Stokes and McCollum have done already have been completely transformative for the individual cricketers in the side. So I really like the example of um, in the Breeley piece, um, he picks out a Pope's first ball against Abrar Ahmed in, I think, the second test in Pakistan, where um, Ahmed will take, what, seven from the first innings and England are under a little bit of pressure and first ball, uh, Pope plays a reverse sweep um, because that's the thing that he feels is the best way to put pressure back onto Pakistan. Um, and how if that brushes his glove and pops up the first hit, that looks horrendous. But Pope ends up scoring 60 and that's the best way for England to get back in the game. It's unconventional. It might not work all the time. St- uh, Pope might be castigated for it if it doesn't quite work out. But it's probably the best way for them to work. And you've got a lot of these players who didn't have great test careers before Stokes McCullum took over. And they've had this success unlike any sort of success they've had before. And I think judging what Stokes and McCullum are trying to do just on this one series against a team, as Ben pointed out earlier, are much better than England on paper. Completely misses the point, I think, um, about what they're trying to do. Um, yeah, you're bang on. As really says, the coda to that is, can they modify it? Can they... He, he's right to point out that if Ollie Pope just used him as the example of that story... You know, gloves one doing something funky in the first half an hour and England go down in the first test match. Then sympathy for the for the for the the overall idea will be in short supply for sure. But can they can they modify it? Can they find enough light and shade within this experiment um, to win enough games of cricket? And if they can, then it will be remembered for a long, long time. Mm. Um, on Ireland, they won their warm up a game. They they won their warm up game against a side that was essentially a hybrid of Essex twos <laughs> and also Ireland, with a handful of Irish players representing Essex. Ireland won by ten wickets. James McCollum and PJ Moore put on uh, unbeaten two hundred thirty two run stand for the first wicket in that run chase. Still first class that game. Still first class that game, despite it just being a sort of vague amalgamation of it was 11 on 11 yeah I don't mind it was fine don't mind it Um, there have been some interesting noises from the Irish camp in the last few days about how they're viewing this game Uh, on their decision to rest Josh Little who's involved in the IPL final uh, their performance director Richard Holdsworth said we're incredibly proud to go and play against England and at Lords it's a special occasion however it's not a pinnacle event and where we have to put our energies and ensure we have the best team on the park is in our pinnacle events. Going to a World Cup qualifier where only 10 teams, two from the qualifier, can qualify for that World Cup, that is still the biggest prize in the game as far as we're concerned, and certainly as far as the world game is concerned. Um, Yesterday, their captain, Andrew Barberni, said their qualifier in Scotland in front of 30 people against Italy was far more important than the Lord's Test, as nothing can trump World Cup 
qualification for them. Um, before I come to you, Ben, I want to read out an email from an Irish listener, Gary Murphy. Greetings from Ireland to all on the pod. I find the furore in some quarters about Ireland's approach to this test match slightly hilarious. It speaks to England's position in the game, but they cannot understand that this is one of the least important games of Ireland's summer. Whilst a test match at Lords will certainly be a great occasion and hopefully a great contest, the, upcom- the upcoming qualifiers for the ODI and T20 World Cups are of much more consequence. Cricket for the emerging nations is a do or die sport. If Ireland do not qualify for the World Cup in India, it will then be at least 12 years between appearances in the tournament. Considering that growing the sport in this country relies on media exposure, another four years without a 50 over World Cup would be a disaster. Meanwhile, a test win would be just that, a good win. There's no apparent pathway to get access to competing in the World Test Championship, just random one-off tests over the next FTP. So yes, Josh Little is being rested at his own request for the most important games of Ireland's year, and it's the right decision. Looking forward to the game. Um, Ben, do you want to take on Gary? Uh, No, not not especially. I kind of, I mean, Phil, you you were more uh, irritated by Little's decision, I guess, than than I was like I think I saw the logic to begin with and I I mean there's also a question of um of sort of like it's not just a balance of priorities it's a balance of probabilities as well like even if Josh Little plays that Ireland test England go into it as as heavy favourites I don't think you know Little has not got a huge amount of first class experience I mean he's a you know very good bowler but you know he's got six first class wickets at an average over 50 there's no guarantee he comes in and all of a sudden Ireland are a transformed test team obviously but imagine he would be if he had the chance to put the time into it but that's not the way things have played out. Whereas Ireland, I mean, they're not among the two favourites to qualify from that qualifier, but they have a decent chance. You know, I mean, they beat West Indies in a series in West Indies uh, in this um, Cricket World Cup Super League cycle. They've pushed teams like South Africa, England, New Zealand close, taking games off some of those teams. Um, so they, they are a good ODI side who will have a decent chance of qualifying for the World Cup. And so that is another thing like, okay, yes, a win against England at Lords might well be, you know, the biggest moment in Ireland's history if that were to happen, but it's so remote and the addition of Josh Little would make it would not increase likelihood that much that I can see why they've gone why they've gone this way. Um it's it's obviously a shame and it's also, yeah, it's a fault of the World Test Championship that it was introduced to sort of bring context to Test cricket and to you know, to keep the interest outside of the big three teams, but it hasn't reached all the teams that it could, and you know, it would not be out of the you know, out of the realms of possibility to come up with a structure that would include the likes of Ireland, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe. Uh, but that's not the way that it is at the moment, and so I can see why. While it's a great occasion and should be you know a fun few days, Ireland's thoughts, as England's do, will kind of be lying elsewhere, and they wouldn't want to jeopardise. Just as England aren't playing Mark Wood because they don't want to jeopardise him for the Ashes. Uh, the World Cup qualifier is, is Ireland's ashes effectively and they don't want to jeopardise Josh Little for that. Hmm. Um, one of the biggest stories of the week was... Hold J- on. He called me out in the first place. I've got to be able to respond. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, all I would say is, uh, in on the Josh Little case, if they wanted him in their 11, then I'm just surprised that he wouldn't be rushing back to play the game. Hmm. That's all. Uh, you, he is a cricketer by trade. You have to play cricket. You can't be resting for the big ones when this is obvious. This is self-evidently a big one. It's not the big one, and I respect that and I understand that. And pragmatically, it's far more important that Ireland secure that qualification if possible, rather than get a, get a result at Lords for sure. Totally, don't have any question on that. But I'm just, I just find it peculiar from the the boys' perspective if they did want him and we don't even know they might they might have thought you know you're a really, really useful t20 bowler but we've got better options for lords in the test matches i don't know but if they did want him in that 11 even though he finished the ipl at a crazily late time i'd still have just assumed that the kid would want to jump on a plane leg it to lords have a couple of nets and then see how it goes nothing ventured nothing lost it's not like you're going to be bent double come the end of it uh, because you've only really been bowling two over spells anyway every four or five days for the last two months so I just find I just found it um, a bit dispiriting I suppose that he that, that he didn't think that he could do it all I mm. suppose because to me it, it, it doesn't feel like he would be flogging himself but then perhaps that's that's uncharitable I don't know 
I don't know. Certainly the overall point, the macro point is, I don't, dis I don't dispute that. You know, the Lord's Test match, it's great that it happens. Uh, and Balberni's quotes, while I totally understand them, they felt maybe a little bit um, dismissive of the struggle to have got Ireland to full member status and securing their test status in the first place. But nonetheless, I understood where he was coming from. So I don't really knock any of that. I don't really knock any of that. Um, but it's not just an exhibition game either. Mm -hmm. yeah. It carries more, more than that. And it carries more than that for everybody who pays the money, everybody who goes there as well. We're trying to grow Irish cricket. Well, what better way than, than a great test match? Or rather, there is one better way being in the World Cup, sure. But behind that is having a, you know, a landmark game at, at Lord's. And, and I think wanting to see Josh Little play isn't anything on Irish cricket. Is any test match, you want to see the best 11 players on each side right. play. Yeah. Um, I think that's all. I just thought he would want to play. Yeah. I think the other thing as well, I think when we talk about, you know, T20 cricket versus other types of cricket and we talk about it in terms of, well, it's just a decision players would make for their, you know, financial well-being and all that sort of thing. We forget how big a prize players see the IPL as being. And, you know, for, for say, for someone like Joe Root or whoever, it's not just that you want to go there to learn. You want to go and win one of the biggest prizes in sport. And I was struck by Devon Conway after the, um, after the IPL final said that that was the, the, the biggest thing he's won in his career. And this is a guy who won the World Test Championship with New Zealand. Um, and so in the in the rain in Southampton, yeah. But, but I do I do hear yeah. What, and and, and so and so for Josh as well, he could he could also have taken the choice as Stokes did say to fly home before that final week and get preparation to his battle, and then maybe he would have been able to play a Lord's Test. But for him, I guess the chance of winning an IPL was more significant than the chance of playing or even winning a Lord's Test, and that's increasingly how players see it. That is a huge prize for them. I, I don't I don't knock any of that. Uh, one of the biggest stories of the week was Jason Roy's decision to terminate his England incremental contract to take up what is likely to be a two-year deal with Major League Cricket in the States. Here's what Mark Butcher made of the news. Uh, Mark, Jason Roy in the ECB agreed the termination of Roy's ECB incremental contract last week, essentially so that Roy can take up a two-year deal to play in Major League Cricket out in the States. It was presented in some quarters, as being a really big deal. I don't quite see why it would be. He's not ending his England career at all. He's seeking security without yet jeopardising his England selection. Look, I can see why um, the initial reaction from outside was not quite hysterical, but veering on that um, as as to, to it speaking of the end of civilization as we know it. But I can also understand why uh, Jason was then very quick along with the ECB to put out a statement to say, look, this is this is not me ending my England career in favour of MCL. It's me um, making sure that I've got some financial security over a two-year period where um, England don't have a massive amount in the way of, um, you know, white ball cricket. I'm on an in incremental contract. It is not worth as much as I would be getting for, for signing up for the MCL. Um, and the two parties have been able to come together and and uh, and decide a, a sensible way forward. It it does have it does have all of the sort of the ingredients, however, of of something that you, you could see happening with players who perhaps are not. You know, Jason's thirty two. He missed out on the on the World Cup um, just recently. That sort of job security as an international cricketer is not. Um, you know, it's not in, particularly as, as somebody that's on one of the sort of like the incremental contact contracts is not particularly safe. Um, and so you could potentially see other guys, younger guys in the sort of in the middle of their careers towards uh, as opposed to being towards the end, seeing that as something that would be extremely, um, you know, extremely sort of I can't think of the right word now because my daughter is running around in the background behind me. Um, extremely tempting. Um, shall we say, mm. um, going forward. So look, it, 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 the, the, worm, the can of worms is, is open. Um, Jason is looking after, looking after himself and looking after his family. Um, and at the moment, it's sort of, I, I, I kind of like the way that the players and the ECB are able to sort of navigate their way around these things mm. um, without any ultimatums being issued, which of course, um, you know, Rob Key is smart enough to understand that that, that, that that he doesn't win or the ECB don't win under those circumstances, that there has to be a way of um, creating some sort of compromise whereby the, the, the international team can get the players that they want and the players can 
can earn the money that they want, I guess. I mean, and that's and that's what it is, bottom line. And there's, there's a lifestyle element to it that's more than just money, um, right? Roy was part of four different T20 or T10 competitions over the winter, as well as playing in three England tours. So that's seven different competitions, basically, over one winter. And as he found out, as much as anyone really in the last year, your stock can quite rapidly decline and improve. Like he probably doesn't get that IPL deal if he doesn't have that really good PSL after having lost all sort of form last summer. And so even for a World Cup winner like him, you can quite quickly see yourself out of favour. And then this offers him a degree of certainty at his age with the type of cricket that he plays that actually the ECB just can't offer long term. Because currently even full central contacts are only one year long and if Roy's getting a, a contract here which is like actually kind of whatever you do for the next year you are going to get this paycheck in over a year's time exactly which doesn't really exist at the moment it makes it makes perfect sense I mean it, it's, it's the market doing its thing isn't it um, and if the if the people wielding the, the big checks are, are happy to take the risk on offering a two year deal where um, you know the the international boards are not then you know, it's difficult difficult to see a player knocking that back. Um, and again, it's kind of it's, it, the the ball goes back to to boards, and it goes back to international cricket in terms of well, how how do you go about giving your players some form of security in a in a world whereby you are not the only game in town anymore? Um, and and that's and that's kind of why the situation has come up. And will continue to come up, and then I suppose the other side of it, of course, is the, you know, the the chiselling away at the at the northern hemisphere summer, which is again something else that, that we haven't really had to contend with before. Um, all the other boards understand and know about, um, you know, the the other competing markets that there are in the southern hemisphere summer, um, but we've kind of been on our own and had it our own way throughout the, the Northern Hemisphere and, and that is no longer the case. Um, there was a big old warning sign flashed up when, when the MCL was first mooted uh, and, and that is now um, bleeping away uh, at the top, of the, at the, top yeah. of the cliff, warning everyone. And I, and I guess like the, the, the scary thing, I guess, in this story is just the vast sums of money involved and it's, and it's a quantity of money that the ECB can only currently play, pay quite a select number of players, right? So you have the few guys in the, cent- the, the big central contracts who are paid loads who, for whom this fee wouldn't be a total game changer. But kind of outside that select group, the ECB actually, you know, look at the top um, fees on offer in the 100. The M- MLC is already dwarfing what the ECB can offer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's and that story will run and run, won't it? I mean, who knows? The, you know the uh, the American market has tried with with, with football soccer, um, you know since the seventies and, and and kind mm-hmm. of have had peaks and troughs in terms of that that success, uh, and you know cricket has been has been attempted there before as well. You just feel that the the, the game changer here is that is that the the Indian market at home in India as opposed to just relying upon. Um, you know, migrants, expats, or whatever you want to call them, in in the states have a stake in it now, mm. um, and, and 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 that is where the the game changes enormously, isn't it? Where where you have the backing of, um, backing of IPL franchises and IPL franchise owners who who have actually started to make well have made their money back now and are kind of looking elsewhere to branch out and uh, and spend their gazillions, um, and so the the likelihood. Um, of, of everyone sort of going, oh well, it's all right. This this one will blow over and, and go away, like all the rest of the uh, the attempts in the states. That that conversation becomes a heck of a lot less confident um, for people. Mm. And and of course, you know, again, the, the winners always um, in this in, in this scenario are all the players now. You know, that's and and we've we've gone down this road many times before. But in the past, the players were kind of always did as they were told and were kind of consider yourself lucky to get a to, to get a deal to get a tour or to get a, a winter fee or whatever it might be and that's just simply not the case anymore the players are the players are in charge mm. i guess finally um i think most people can can totally see why a player um like roy with him being a white ball specialist at the moment at his age not 
guaranteed a spot on the England side making this decision. Would you begrudge, that might not be the right word, would you begrudge a, a player in their early 20s who um, had or might have a central, a full central contract on the table um, making a decision like this in the near future? I mean, Harry Brook is the, is the player who's in that sort of position, but a player like a Brook who comes along in the, in the next two or three years who has all these options on the table um, and financially doesn't need um, what was on the table, but they might actually just prefer the lifestyle of of playing a, a smaller set of T20s around the world. No, I, I wouldn't. I, I'd have no. I'd have no beef with it. I mean, it comes with its own inherent risk, doesn't it? I mean, you you, you then you do kind of cut yourself adrift um, from the sort of the stability, albeit it's a, it's it's pretty unsexy, but the the stability of you know, maybe it might be county contract. It might be a sort of semi-international one or whatever. And, and, and the um, the knowledge that that will always be there type, uh, you know, type, type scenario. So, you know, you, if you if you do decide to do that before, perhaps you've made your name in any great way as an international player, there, there are risks involved in that too. You know, it's not like you're just going to skip off into the sunset with your, with your bags of cash and everything will be fine. Um, so no, I mean, look, it's a great adventure, isn't it, for people at the moment? Um, and and I say this without you know without my sort of traditional and and, and international cricket cap on because it kind of it's a scenario that I that would never have come you know, it's never come to me. I would never I don't know the answer to what I would do in the circumstances whereby the landscape in terms of what I've grown up watching in, in cricket is so wildly different from from the one that I did you know in in this scenario. So I had so none of the None of the, the the allegiances and none of the sort of like the the pulls on the heartstrings um, of nostalgia and, and the sort of the cricket that I watched growing up they don't really they stopped applying at some point now where are we got guys guys born um, past the the millennium are now playing international cricket so that the kind of all of that stuff is is or all of those rules have ceased to uh, cease to apply in this case so I you know you kind of you, you wish people well, you know. You hope you hope in in personal circumstances that it goes great, but you also hope that somehow there is room for the sort of the way that the way that things have always been, or perhaps a, a version of the way that things have always been, are allowed to go coexist with players doing their own thing and 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 suiting suiting themselves, suiting their own lifestyles, um, and and earning packets of money for it. I I, I don't understand. I don't see how that that, that that's going to work um, in in practice. Because something always has to give, right? You know, so there is always going to be there's always going to be one side of the of, of the um, of the game that kind of comes comes unstuck or at least falls by the wayside. That's kind of the nature of it. One one will devour the other, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that that's what what we are witnessing is is this is seismic change. Jason Roy's situation is not the thing that's driving it, and it's not the sort of like the the um, you know the end of days scenario that's just occurred with with one player, um, that perhaps is a, a, just a little way off, but it's not far off. Mm. I guess I guess like the I don't know the way the England players over the winter talked about that Australia ODI series off the T Twenty World Cup in particular, like bilateral white ball cricket seems like the thing that could go, and you wouldn't really lose that much sleep over like even the South Africa series, England in South Africa. Uh, in January, February time, when it was around the SA20, they were selling out packed houses for the SA20. But England are playing an, an ODI series, and there are people there, but it's not as many people there. And players are being paid less money for that than they are. The best players are being paid less money for that yeah. elsewhere. And if that goes, and you keep World Cups, is that is that that bad a thing? Well, I, I don't. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I've I've kind of thought. I've thought for ages and you know, before. Before the whole thing had been flipped on its head, that you know, whilst there were all these um, T20 tournaments going on around the world, and whilst players were, were spending all their time, you know, the, playing in these, that the club game, um, you know, that there isn't, there shouldn't be that much need for international bilateral um, T20s outside of outside of World Cups. And of course, the arguments around associates playing and all those types of things, they all they all come in, and you understand that there is, you know, there is there. Their way of of, of um, 
of, of putting themselves in or putting their players in the shop window that then eventually come and play in the franchises. And that's been a, a real success story for, for some of those teams. Um, but but now I think what, what what you've just said is that you're kind of looking at it and going, well, what what is that really when there's all this white ball cricket going on? That seems to there's a lot more World Cups now as well, and that's another factor that kind of that um, there was never there was never there before. So you've got World Cups every every couple of years in the T20 format. The 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 50 over World Cup seems to have come around really fast, simply because there have been other international world tournaments in between. Um, and you kind of feel like, well, you know, unless you're unless you're actually preparing for that tournament, what is the point of having the, you know, playing these series? Um, you know, in, in Pakistan's case, they're not going to play any at all, perhaps between now and then, and that's that's not by design. But you you, you kind of you understand where you kind of thinking to yourself, well, in, in a calendar where um, you know it seems as though uh, the players are off um, all parts of the world, all of the time. And no one seems to get any sort of rest. And there is no, no period where there isn't any cricket. Um, you know, is anyone going to miss another three match, five match ODI tour, um, barring the, uh, barring the advertisers, I suppose. And that's, and that's kind of where, where it feels as though we're at. It feels like that's where the players are at. I mean, if you're asking, asking the top guys to go, you know, at the end of, end of this summer after the ashes and, um, uh, if it wasn't a World Cup year, uh, you know, we're going to go and, and, and play a five-match ODI series in wherever it might be in New Zealand, you'd find half of them would, would have no interest whatsoever. They'd be, they'd be putting their feet up or signing up to go and play in a, in a T10 league somewhere in, for, for a week um, for twice the cash. Mm. Uh, <laughs> it's just, you know, what, what do you do? Given, given the chance, you know, I'm, I'll ask you, given the chance to, uh, to, work, to work sort of half the... Uh, half the year instead of all of it and get paid four times as much money, what would you do? Tough decision. You'd, 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 I'm, be, I'm you'd be there. <laughs> you'd, be, <laughs> you'd, be in, you'd be there scribbling away. Yeah, exactly. That's the situation. Well, cheers your time, Butch. Catch you soon. For our very first Kia movement that inspires moment, Kia is giving you the chance to win the best seats in the house for the Surrey Middlesex T20 Blast game on the 22nd of June at the Kia Oval. You and four friends or family will get the opportunity to watch the game with Kumar Sangakara. I visited the best seats in the house last week and I can personally vouch for the fact that these really are the best seats in the house. They are genuinely brilliant. You get a proper VIP experience, including food and drinks, a tour of the Kia Oval before watching the match from the boundaries edge. Uh, it's an opportunity of a lifetime for a chance to win. All you need to do is enter via the link in the description. As I said, I cannot recommend that enough. Hannah asks, hey guys, I'm going to my first women's cricket match this year and taking a trip down to Nottingham for day three of the test match. How do you think Australia will feel the absence of Meg Lanning's leadership in this game? Or are they truly that good that missing one fantastic player and being replaced by another fantastic player will make little difference? I struggle to think of any other world sports team as successful as this Australia women's side. Um, so yeah, this week, Meg Lanning was ruled out of the ashes due to medical reasons. Uh, Alyssa Healy will captain in her place. Um, their coach was saying that the squad was a bit rattled by the news. Goes without saying that we wish Meg a speedy recovery. Um, ben, Healy's talked about potentially moving down the order. Um, and if she does, Australia's top five will look very, very different to the last time they played a test match. Uh, yes. And um... <laughs> uh, two weeks away. <laughs> no, 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 it will. And But, but the thing is, yeah, this this will make Australia, uh, I guess, significantly weaker, I suppose. And obviously, you, you know, thoughts are with Meg Lanning. They said it's not related to the break she took from the game um, last year, but there's no evidence of, or there's not been any disclosure on what, what the issue actually is. But then what Australia sen tend to seem to do, you know, sometimes they have players who are injured and sometimes, you know, they have players who retire and they just fill it without even, like the player who comes in somehow is even better than the person they've just missed out, you know, like a... Elise Perry sort of falls out of the frame T20 cricket and then Tali McGrath comes in and is, you know, the best T20 player you've kind of ever seen. Uh, Phoebe Litchfield, who is likely to come in at the top of the order. I mean, it was what, she was 15 when we were all watching that sessions being like, oh God, this is scary. Uh, <laughs> and, and now she'll get her chance. And and yeah, so, you know, it, it makes England, I suppose, slightly closer to Australia overall, but equally that Australian team is so strong and that structure they have is so strong that kind of whoever they bring in out of a pool of, you know, a big pool of players you think will be able to, to fill the gap mm. pretty comfortably, really. I don't know. 
I don't know if I fully agree with that. Okay. It feels to me it's not insignificant. You lose you lose the Bradman of women's cricket, that's not insignificant. With Haynes having retired as well, that is a double whammy. If Healy, as she's alluded to, won't be opening because of the captaincy, that changes the the, the makeup of that side quite profoundly. And it's it's, I understand totally what Ben's saying, but we can't underestimate the impact that that will have. Uh, the more I think about this series, the more I think if England can somehow get a result in that first test match, which is obviously their strongest suit, uh, then it really does open it up. It opens it up to, to a, a humdinger of a series. I have a sort of feeling, I wrote it in the magazine, that I thought Australia would win 10-6. But I'm leaning more to to a, a cheeky eight eight, you know. I can, if England could just get that one, mm. get that that four points on the board with the Test match, then it really does open it up. And while they are a phenomenon, a, a sporting phenomenon, they are they're not as Izzy Wong cheekily acknowledged. They're not exactly the same makeup as they once were. They're not this machine. They are still a combination of individuals, some of whom are still going to be making their way trying to trying to make, make a reputation for themselves. Litchfield is probably a genius, but, you know, there's, there'll be a question mark if you look at, say, the Australian men's side, there's a question mark against how Cameron Green's going to go in England, even though we sort of know that he's a genius. So none of it's a given just because they are the yellow wall. None of it's a given. And, and I think the landing thing is, is huge, and that would have shaken them up for sure. Mm. And I suppose the other significant thing is it's a, it's a five-day test, isn't it? It's not a four-day test. Um, and... While you know it's been absolutely ages since we've had a, a result in a women's test match, this being five days increases that, and yeah, that would open up the whole series were England to to get one over in that. So yeah, mm. um, the T Twenty Blast has been happening in the last week or so. Um, at the time of recording, Birmingham, Worcestershire, and Somerset are unbeaten. Uh, some highlights from the last week: Daryl Mitchell played a gem of an innings for Lancashire against Notts. It included one ridiculous scoop six off Shaheen where he adjusted really late to a ball that was bowled behind his legs and he's kind of helped it rather than scooped it over the rope. Um, Sean Abbott equaled Andrew Simon's long-standing record for the fastest blast 100. Um, there's a very sweet interview with Abbott on the Surrey social media channels about sharing the record with his hero who passed away just last year. Yeah, um, I, I was there for that. It was lunacy. <laughs> it was one of those where... It, you're you're having a drink and a chat, and there's a cricket match going on, and it's all you know a good knees up, and so, and very very quickly it crept up on you something weird was happening. Mm. I think he made his I think he was fifty fifty knot in about twenty two or twenty three balls, uh, and then just went berserk from there on in. And we were trying to remember what the figure was. We thought it might be thirty three balls, thirty four, thirty five, and and yeah, he equaled it with. With six six as well, so it was the mm. only way he could do it. He went six six to get there in thirty four balls, uh, and crazy. Sorry, being sorry, they then rested him two days later. <laughs> <laughs> but and, and also, this isn't as if you know this is some Aussie big bash all rounder who's kind of had a day out. There was kind of no hint that this was possible for that. Even with that hundred, he averages twelve point eight in not T20 true cricket. Well, that might be technically true, but he made a runnable seventy in the championship, and he yeah. made runs the week before that as well he's been working on his batting and Surrey as Dan Daniel Norcross said they're playing their version of total cricket and so it makes sense um in a sort of grandstanding fashion that they take him from being a seamer who swings the bat to suddenly a rock solid number six record breaker in their t20 side he'll be batting four when Pope's playing for England next you know in, mm. in the championship this is the way that they're doing it they they're in terrifyingly good form um across the board there have been a few proper shellackings, some of which have been on TV. So Craig Overton and Matt Henry ran through Hampshire for Somerset. Uh, Surrey thumped Middlesex at Lords. Uh, there was also a really one-sided game between Lancashire and Leicestershire that took place really early on a Thursday, I think. But, but that was because uh, United, Man United were playing a game at Old Trafford later that evening. So Was it, it, was it also a doubleheader? Is that right? It was also a doubleheader. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I think one new-ish element in the blast this year is that squads are probably as stable as they've ever been. So the tournament's taking place in fewer than two months and there's no England international white ball cricket. So you're not losing established white ball players. 
And I think that might highlight the gaps in squad depth more than in previous years. And I think in some years, um, lack of availability for the stronger squads actually makes it a more interesting competition. Um, whereas this year, that should probably not happen as much. Um, there was some chat online about uh, the London derby not being as well attended as you'd expect at Lords. Uh, the kind of fixture that in previous years has been a sellout. Some fingers were pointed at the 100 influencing um, sales. Um, the 100 is often cheaper than the blast um, for a punter to go and I guess generally more competitive um, than some of the games we've seen in the blast so far. Um, but some more positive news, Ravi Bopara is in the form of his life. Um, he scored 144 of 49 balls for Sussex 2s and they scored 324 against Middlesex 2s. Um, and since then he's gone 47 off 25, 88 not out of 49 and then 3 for 18 off 3 overs against Surrey. Um, which is great news. Yeah, the three for was an absolute masterpiece. Hang it in the Louvre. It was phenomenal. <laughs> and he got three good players out. I forget who they are now. But uh, changed the course of that game completely. Bowling these sort of unhittable pieces of cheek. Like one after the mm. other. Pure brass. Each, each delivery. He's bowling slower and slower and slower. And becoming less and less and less hittable as he goes through, through the motions. It's gorgeous to watch. Thir uh, 38 years old and he's still very much got it um sri lanka school uh, sri lanka announced um an odi squad for their series against afghanistan not normally something we'd comment on but it saw a recall for dimuth Karunaratne, who has a fascinating odi career i think i've once mentioned on the podcast before but basically it's an underwhelming odi career he's never scored 100 he doesn't score that quickly but he only gets picked in world cup years pretty much so he played twice in 2011 not at all in 2012, four games in 2013, 11 games in 2015, then didn't play in 2016, 17 or 18, then played 11 games in 2019 where he captained them at the World Cup, played six games in the following three years, and now he's back in a World Cup year. So 24 of his 34 ODI appearances have come in World Cup years. Big Frank. Um, big Frank. Um, are you dreaming of some winter sun? Can you see yourself relaxing on a beautiful beach of soft white sand, hearing the gentle lapping of the crystal clear waves whilst you sip on the drink of your choice before watching an exhilarating game between England and the West Indies? If so, join Gulliver's Sports Travel on this exciting tour following the current T20 World Champions as they tour the Caribbean for five T20s and three ODIs this December. They're fully escorted, Tours can include everything you need from flights, accommodation, transfers, the all-important match tickets, and much more. Gulliver's take care of all the details so you can relax and enjoy the fast-paced cricketing action in the sun. Call them today on 01684878979 or you can visit their website, which we'll leave in the description below. Samir writes in to say, love the show. Um, granted, Moeen didn't do much in the IPL final, but after another IPL win, he has a serious trophy cabinet. He's a 50 over World Cup winner, T20 World Cup winner, Ashes winner, Blast winner, two times IPL winner, two times Bangladesh Premier League winner. He's a 100 runner up, um, Blast runner up and a T20 World Cup runner up as well. And a um, best selling children's novelist. As and, a, well. and a best selling The legend of novelist. Spark Hill. Um, it is quite impressive the IPL final happened over the bank holiday weekend um Phil you enjoyed Donny's stumping of Schumann Gill um not only a brilliant piece of work but utterly pivotal in the game um there's a long list as we know of cool Donny moments that's the coolest of the lot for me that beats even hitting a six to win a world cup final yeah no not really <laughs> but it was astonishing I was watching it with Taha in the office um and no one even noticed what he'd done. I mean, it was pure sleight of hand stuff. You know, there was, there was something so beautifully uh, deceitful about it. And it was the end of the over as well. And you know what he does? At the end of an uh, over in normal circumstances, he just gets it and then just sort of rolls it away and walks to the other end. He did the same thing at the end of the over. And looking around... Even his own teammates didn't fully know what had happened. Gil knew, because when you're out, you're yeah. out, you know. And I knew, because I saw the, the, the foot move. But people were still lo looking at Dhoni. And because he is like this ultimate poker player and has built a life on being too cool for school, 
uh, it was not immediately evident even to the people around him what, what he'd actually pulled off. It was something like 0.01 seconds from the time the, the, the ball hit the gloves to the removal of the bales. Uh, Gill was, I think, on 39 from 20-odd balls. It ends one of the great IPL uh, stints. He is he's the, the best of the best of the young lads. Um, he is destined for greatness and then even maybe a little bit on top of that we shall see it's fascinating to to wait for that but it reminded the Dhoni dismissal reminded me of what Ben Folks said a few years ago in an interview with me um where he said he, he likes the aesthetic of the Australian style that you take it that you give slightly in the hands on your on your elbow on, on your hip bone uh Ian Healy style and then you move through with a swish to take the bales when you're making a stumping. He said, but Donny's is the best because there it's all effect and no show. And he has his hands in front of his body, right on the cusp of where the stumps are, and he doesn't give. So sometimes maybe the ball might pop out of the glove. And certainly in the, the early years before he became a really refined keeper, it, it was a bit heavy in, in, the, in the palm sometimes. But it gives him that opportunity to take the bales quicker than than the more conventional way of doing it. And folks has said that he's tried to ape the Dhoni style in his own game because obviously these split seconds are critical. Uh, so, yeah, look, it was just a beautiful moment in, 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 in a stunning game of cricket. It was very apt that it finished about 2 o'clock in the morning on a Monday night. It was just perfectly IPL. And they still had 100,000 people going berserko in, they in all the, stayed the for stand. The presentation after yeah the, the main thing with that stumping was he was actually out by miles but gill's feet foot wasn't actually out of his crease for very long at all yeah so as yeah. soon as you look at one replay it's like it's not even close but yeah, yeah it was a brilliant piece of wicket keeping um well adia sharma from wisdom india was at the ground until 3 a.m on tuesday morning he didn't get back to his hotel until 5 a.m um here's how he saw the game we're joined by Adia Sharma. The IPL final spilt into a third day. It didn't nearly, it didn't finish until nearly 2 a.m. because of all the rain. Adia, just off the TV in the UK, the atmosphere looked incredible. 100,000 people, pretty much all of them supporting Chennai, going ballistic at the end. I'm still buzzing from what I saw last night. Um, I mean, I, I've covered games in Bangalore this year in Chennai, two of the you know crowd pullers of in the, in the country, but to have have nearly you know hundred thousand people around, and uh, you know say chanting one name together. It this was quite a surreal experience, and uh, yeah, I mean the entire vibe of the place you could you could hear it. It just sounded like a whole um, you know a, an extended audio system. It was just like a woofer everywhere. Everyone's jumping, cheering. Um, not dampened by rain. I was very surprised to see even on the second day uh, such a huge uh, turnout, and. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the Narendra Modi Stadium is is nominally the Gujarat home ground, yet everyone in the crowd seems to be wearing yellow and supporting Chennai. Um, why are Chennai so popular? Is it is it basically just Dhoni? I think I would say like 80-90% of it is Dhoni. Uh, that man carries a certain um, legacy with him. He has a fan base that has developed over like so many years. People just don't want to let him go. So they keep coming in. They keep coming from different cities. They travel hours and hours to just, you know, just see him in flesh for that one one match. Uh, I must say, though, that there was a good amount of, of Gujarat support yesterday. I saw a lot of blue flags uh, there. But obviously, when you see that yellow from afar, you can understand, you know, what what chunk of, of the audience is dominated by that, that yellow color. And even at the end, after you know it was nearly two o'clock, everything was finished. Uh, the match was end. That match had ended. The presentation was on. Everyone was still there. I mean, a lot of people had left, but a good amount of people were still there. You know, just in that weather, just there to listen to Dhoni say something, at least anything, at the la very last moment. Also, and and what did Dhoni say at the end? <laughs> it's always he always keeps it very vague. So uh, he he did say that it's it's probably a very good time to retire if you if you think of it circumstantially, but he wants to gift uh, his fans probably one more year. So it, it's up to his body. He's gonna work hard and see if that happens. Again, he's keep it keep like he's kept it very open ended. But 
um the possibility that he he might play one more year is itself a good um sort of a feeling for a lot of fans who just cheered when he said that you know i might come back next year yeah I and mean, just from from what he contributes on the pitch he obviously got a, a first ball at the end of the chase but if, if you're going to get a duck that's the best way to get a duck um but he he uh an action that brilliant stumping to get rid of Shuman Gill, lovely ball from Jadeja just turning it past Gill's outside edge. But he he still very much got it with the gloves. Um and also just on, on Chennai and what does this mean for them? Um it's their fifth title and in in a way very impressive because they've it, it's a very new look Chennai's team. It's different to the ones that have won in the past, Jadeja and Dhoni aside. Yeah, absolutely. Uh you know, to think of it that they had you know some very important players missing. Um and you know, they were Obviously, Ben Stokes missed most of the tournament. Um, I mean, he was just not there uh, because of injury. And uh, there were also a few other domestic players who had done well for them last year. Uh, Simajit Singh, Mukesh Chaudhary, they weren't there. To have a new-look team uh, and sort of a a set of ageing uh, superstars as well and still manage to beat teams that look much better on paper is just a test- testament to what I feel Dhoni and Fleming have sort of developed in the CSK culture that, you know, it's, it's, you just need to keep fighting. There's always a chance. And that's what happened uh, last night as well. You know, at one point it felt like they were uh, being outclassed by Gujarat, the way Gujarat was batting at the start. And even midway through the chase, it felt like it was stuttering a bit, but still, you know, there's someone who comes out, uh, you know, even an Ambati Raidu at the fag end of his career, uh, you know, playing his last game, he comes out and hits a couple of sixes. That is the kind of, uh, you know, setup that they've developed, that anyone can come in on a particular day and become a hero. Mm. How do you think they manage that? Because you're right, if you look at that side on paper, um, it's, it is inferior to some of the top teams in that competition. I mean, their bowling attack um, was almost led by a Sri Lankan in Paterana who has barely played international cricket. He's really coming into his own this tournament. He's been tasked with one of the most difficult jobs there is. Um, they completely transformed the player like Rahane, who's got a really quite limited IPL record in recent years. What do you think they, they do to, to get the most out of these players? Is it kind of role clarity? Yeah, I think uh, from what I've seen and heard, uh, I think what Dhoni and Fleming do is first create an uh, an environment that is very comfortable for players to, to sort of thrive. Uh, they don't put that pressure on players to, to you know, uh, to, to be a certain way. They are, they are very clear about what is the strength and weakness. And I say weakness because that's also important. They know what is the weakness of a player. So they don't, they don't try to stretch it. Uh, you know, someone like a Tushar Deshpande at this point, he's raw. But they know that he's got a certain skill set and they can use him for a particular more, you know, aspect of the game. Patirana is raw. Using him for an aspect of the game. Raidu also. People like these who, you know, who might have a specific skill set, just maximizing that. Um, I think that's what Dhoni and his team does. Uh, Fleming said yesterday also that um, Rahane now has a lot more clarity because, uh, you know, he sort of had this, um, maybe in previous franchises, he had this mental block where he had to bat a certain way, as in like he had to build, accumulate. Here, he was given the freedom to express and, you know, come in at number three and, and play his shots. And that, I think that sort of elevates the performances of players when they get that clarity, when they get that comfort from the team that, you know, we are there, we back your strengths and we know about your weaknesses. I think that creates a, a comfortable environment because mm. there are too many people outside who are criticizing. So, mm. and Just on the finish, um, kind of remarkable. So Chennai needed 51 off the last 20, then 23 off the last 15, which is kind of crazy, 28 off five balls. And then they really stuttered uh, and, and only scored, I think, 13 off the following 13 balls to leave them needing 10 off two. So it really seesawed at the end. Um, Mohit Sharma really stuck to his guns with the the Yorker plan and it just didn't work. I mean, it's, it's what, seven years after Ben Stokes ended a final in a similar way. Um, are, are you surprised that bowlers still stick to the Yorker plan in situations like that? Because if you get it slightly wrong, it's full tosses and slot balls. And as you saw with Jadeja, he doesn't even get hold of the second one. It goes, races away to the boundary. Yeah, I th- I think what happens is probably at that moment, it's better to have sort of like one plan and stick to it. Otherwise, it sort of creates a confusion because there are always other people coming in and saying things. So probably like, because Yorker, if done right, it's probably a very good option to have. Um, 
and I mean you could see even like previous two balls I think earlier in the over Mohit Sharma did bowl really well I think those two Yorkers were really on point but this is how it is you know you sometimes just it's it's probably like how Chennai does very often just eke out a win through something and the last ball it just came to his pads and he flicked it off and even if a few centimeters here and there could have mm. been very different mm. but I think that's where it's important for someone like you know a Jadeja who has that experience who knows you know that he can still hold steady and deliver right at the end also and not get flustered by by the situation well it was definitely a finale that was uh, worth the wait in the end Adia thanks a lot for your time catch you soon if you're looking for the perfect Father's Day gift, then look no further than Wisdom.com. We're offering up to 30% off all cricket merchandise before the big day. Um, we've got the, got the rye, got glasses, tank cards from high quality, cricket-themed spirits to stylish glasses, mugs, phones, cases, and wallets. We've got everything to make your dad's day extra special. <laughs> Don't miss out and have, head over to Wisdom.com now to find the ideal gift for your cricket-loving dad. Neil writes in to say, I love the podcast. Absolute essential listening for me as soon as it comes out. Good lad. I was a bit bored the other day and managed to come up with three pretty decent England test teams. Have I missed anyone major? Does anyone have such depth as this? Who says currently cricket is broken? So in, in the ones, we've got Crawley. You're reading out all, all 33 oh, yeah. names. We've got Crawley, Duckett, Pope, Root, Brooks, Stokes, Captain, Bairstow, Robinson, Wood, Anderson, Leach. In the twos, you've got Burns, Jennings, Milan, Lawrence, Captain, Bahannon, Rahan Ahmed, Folks, Wokes, Broad, Stone, Potts. And in the thirds, you've got Sibley, Lees, Haynes, Hain, Vince, Captain, Jax, Billings, Cass, Tongue, Mahmood and Cook. Um, that's excellent work. Um, you missed, you missed that one. Was Vince Archer. captain of the threes? Yeah, which I think I like is that. great. Um, He's playing really well, James Vince, week after week, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I once did something quite similar on, on the first hour of a train journey. Um, I, I think I had Nick Brown opening for the fours, which probably dates it somewhat. <laughs> um, uh, just just on listener interaction, um, apologies to the listener who was on the train from Penzance to Exeter last week, who had their listening to the show disturbed by one of my friends, who kind of weirdly, in my opinion, clocked that they were listening to the podcast and then interrupted them and tapped on the shoulder for a chat, which I think is quite weird. Um, just, yeah. That, espe that, especially that, spotting if, if that you... I think, like... How have you spotted exactly what the person in front of you is listening to? Like, you, you must have stood up at quite a weird angle, then looked directly at their phone. Um, yeah. Anti -social. Poor, they could have just been playing it on the speakers. Unlikely. <laughs> Unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're just going to finish with this beautiful email from Alex. Um, Four years of absolute joy in the midst of uh, in the midst of misery and heartache. My father always loved sport, football, and cricket being his main interests. I tried getting interest in, in watching sport from a young age, but it was never for me. Then four or five years ago, before that famous Headingley test, I started to really enjoy watching and understanding the game. After that test match in particular, I fell in love. Two years ago, I lost my father a lot sooner than we expected. I work as a bricklayer. Um, I used to work with my dad and saw him nearly every day for 30 years. Apart from family support, cricket has helped me like nothing else I could ever imagine. I listen to eight cricket podcasts and have subscriptions to two magazines. Obviously, Wisdom, the best of the bunch. I love the community, the stories and the connections I have with certain people. Ben Stokes, for self-explained reasons, is now a hero for me. Rob Key is a character that has changed my view on life and outlook in a more positive way. It goes without saying that there are many people in this game that are spectacular humans in this amazing game. Gower, Butcher, uh, Athers, Hussain, Tufnell, Flintoff, etc., that improve and cheer up my days. But I want to say thank you too to Phil, Yaz, Ben and Joe. I can never thank you guys enough. It may only be an hour or two a week listening to you in the time I spend reading your magazines, but it's helped me escape reality and into a wonderful world of cricket. The passion and intelligence of the game you guys have inspired in me in other aspects of my life. Yes, cricket has a lot of faults, but what doesn't? Uh, and with the overall love peop from people who enjoy this game, um, we can help fix any problem it has. It's not about putting your head in the sand and hoping it will fix itself. That's not what you guys do. I appreciate every minute of your guys' work to bring out these journalistic works of genius. Uh, sorry about the length of the email, but this sport and your team mean so much to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
um alex so sorry to hear about your father but thank you so much for sending that in and taking the time to send that in that's all incredibly kind um that is all we have time for on today's show cheers ben cheers phil uh, the test stomach starts tomorrow we'll be back next week after that england Ireland test match Hi, I'm here at the Kia Oval today and I want to tell you about this fantastic opportunity. So if you are aged between 11 and 16 and you love cricket, Kia are offering you the chance to train and play at this famous ground on the 23rd of September. You'll be coached by world-class cricket players, including Kumar Sangrakara. You'll get a morning net session followed by a mini tournament on the Kia Oval Green. Throughout my life, cricket has been amazing for me and given me so many opportunities. So again, if you're aged between 11 and 16 and you want to take part, please enter now.